This is Jody Tropiano, the Content Director for Health, and I'm here with Robert Califf, the Head of Clinical Policy and Strategy for Verily and Google Health, DA Commissioner. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, it's great to be here with you. So first off, just would love to chat a little bit about what you're currently working on at Verily and Google Health, and maybe how your 2020 plans have changed in the midst of the pandemic. Working in both organizations. and. As you might imagine, there's a lot of um, uh, synergy, possibility, and overlap uh, between uh, Google Health, which is focused more on the consumer side and the interaction with the vast Google uh, enterprise that deals with um, things like search and YouTube and uh, consumers, and then the Verily side, which is mostly focused on um, healthcare systems, healthcare delivery devices, interactions with uh, pharma and, um, and insurance companies even. Mm -hmm. So I sort of work across both and do what's, uh, what's needed given the experience that I've had. I think I may be one of the oldest employees in the alphabet uh, system at age 68. So I can truly say I've been around the block. A lot has changed because of COVID. You know, on the Google Health side, it's an enormous effort in improving the information source since most people in the world rely on search or YouTube or maps for a significant part of the information they use in everyday life. Uh, and just to find out things about COVID, it's critical. Mm -hmm. On the Verily side, we've been very involved in testing and getting clinical trials done and um, helping businesses come back to work and you know, very practical um, sort of things that are focused on dealing with a pandemic uh, directly in the healthcare system. Switching gears a little bit, would love to get into the current vaccine race and get your thoughts. So, um, you know, promising results coming out of some of the top candidates recently, and, you know, things are, are looking good, but obviously we know the challenges. So just want to get your thoughts on where you think we'll net out by the end of 2020, whether that's, you know, a couple being approved or maybe one or two starting to be distributed. What's your prediction there? Well, I have to start out by saying uh, any prediction is just foolish. Um, it's just too complicated and there's so many things that could happen if I, you know, so I tend to look at it much like anyone that's been involved in drug development thinks a lot about probabilities in a portfolio. And, um, you know, I'd say the probability of having anything mass distributed before January 1st is pretty low. It could happen. Mm -hmm. You know, miracles do happen, and in drug development, you know, you are vaccine development, you may hit it just right mm -hmm. the first time, but, you know, we don't uh, really know what the actual um, uh, defense will be against infection mm -hmm. or the potential side effects until we get these tens of thousands of people trials done. And even then, um, I mean, as everybody knows, with the vaccines, there can be low frequency toxicities that are really important. And you don't really know about um, partial uh, prevention of infection until you get a lot of clinical experience. So, um, you know, then you compound that with all the issues in manufacturing and making sure you have the right product and distributing it. Just the ethical issues and how to distribute uh, the product early on are mm -hmm. very daunting. So if I was a betting person, I would bet against it. Um, as a hopeful person, you know, I'm cheering it on and there is some possibility, but you know, I'd really look into next year before we really have mm -hmm. um, vaccine for wide scale distribution. Yeah. And we just need to keep reminding ourselves, most countries in the world have figured out that if you do things that don't require any technology, um, even I could probably make a mask at the sewing machine now. So masking and social distancing and washing hands has a huge effect on transmission of the virus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's probably a sound prediction. And just digging into some of the manufacturing challenges because globally we've never produced a vaccine at this scale. So where do you see the, the biggest challenges ahead when it comes to supply chain, maybe raw materials even, you know, we're learning that some of the vaccines are double dose needing more raw materials. What do you predict the major challenges will be? Well, um, Gosh, there's so many. Um, I, I really, you know, I think we're, what we're experiencing with testing now is a, is a real lesson. And, you know, the great hope is that we're investing so much in the supply chain before we have 
a vaccine available that I actually do believe that it is possible to mitigate uh, the risk that we'll have huge supply chain problems. But even to get the trials done, we need test results that come back in a reasonable period of time to get people linked up to the testing sites because you don't want to be giving a vaccine to someone who's just gotten infected, for example. But you know, you think about things that you wouldn't wouldn't normally even consider, like are there enough vials to exactly. put the testing material in? And so all those things can be thought about now, and I know people are thinking about them. But then it also is a little bit like a multi-dimensional um, puzzle because you don't know which vaccines are going to win, and each one is a bit different. And so you're making multiple bets, but you can't bet the whole farm on any one, mm -hmm. um, which means there's always going to be some risk and communication um, along the way is going to be critical. And at the FDA level, with your experience there, how do you think they've really had to adapt to ensure both the speediness of approval for vaccines and treatments for COVID, but then also ensuring the safety and ensuring that the data is there? Well, there are a couple of things just to mention. I mean, um, you know, as a person who um, signed off on vaccines for the short period of time that I was commissioner, I was, I was just hyper aware of how complicated just to see, you know, the regular vaccine programs are. There's so many things that can go wrong. And for things like the flu, where um, there's year to year variability, um, it, it, it is really complicated and a small mistake multiplied by multiple fold in a, in a uh, reproducing something in a manufacturing process can be, um, can be really significant. So I think the FDA, I think is all geared up. I feel like um, on the therapeutics and um, vaccine side, I think they're in good shape. Um, I'd also mention, you know, there's an analogy for the therapeutics, particularly to um, accelerated approvals for rare diseases. And, you know, this is something that's very firmly grounded in um, the views of the American public, which is that if you have a disease for which there's no effective treatment, people are willing to take more risk, which means that you put things on the market before you have all the data you would have. And, you know, it's easy as a cardiologist for me to say, you know, compared to ischemic heart disease where we have 20 effective treatments, you wouldn't think about putting a new one on the market until you had done really definitive clinical trials that were large scale enough to really know the risk and benefit because you already have treatments at work. You're just trying to make something better. So I think the therapeutics related to COVID are very much going down a similar pathway. There are going to be good trials done. Mm -hmm. But using the EUA process, people get a bit of a, a bit of a jump um, relative to what would normally be seen. And the key issue then is um, when the dust settles, having all the documentation and the outcome data that you need uh, to make rational decisions in case the epidemic uh, continues for a longer period of time, which is pretty likely that it will, that we'll need therapeutics pretty far out into the future. Mm -hmm. The big, the big thing, I'll just mention the big thing with the vaccine is obviously at what point do you approve something enough to get it on the market? Right. And here this principle, um, you know, I'm 68 years old, so I'm in the high risk group as we've been discussing. Um, and there are others that are readily identifiable. Those of us in the high risk group should, um, according to all previous principles grounded in um, values of the American people and I think people globally, um, you, would, you would go earlier in those people because you can accept more risk in return for the uh, potential benefits. What has that been standard procedure in the past for vaccine or is this a whole new playing field? Well, I think it's a whole new playing field. And, uh, um, you know, there, there's always some uncertainty um, in vaccines, but the norm has been to do very large clinical trials and get the results in hand before anything is done. You know, uh, it's, it's obvious that there are many people concerned about vaccines and 
there are some who are just way out on the scale of being um, concerned. And you don't want um, people who are hesitant about vaccines already to be um, feeling like you're taking unnecessary risks. So I think it's been a very lockdown process. This was this has got to be different because um, you know the the mortality and morbidity from the virus is so large. So how is the you know playing off of that and how we'll have to collaborate in new ways as a pharma industry. Do you think that's really the, the main way that the industry has changed in the midst of this pandemic or has pharma had to adjust other standard procedures throughout this process? You know, when I, when I look at pharma having, um, you know, I've been mostly on the academic side or the regulatory side, but doing a lot of trials, um, you know, for, for four decades now. So um, I don't, I don't think the fundamentals of pharma have really changed at all. That is, when there's a compelling reason to collaborate, pharma has always collaborated. And, you know, we can go back to the days of HIV. Um, we get the same story when there was a need to develop multiple therapies in HIV. You know, it took, it took some uh, hard work to make it all happen, but it really did across sponsors. And I could name many other examples. So I, I don't think that uh, there's been a fundamental change. It's just um, an acceleration and a willingness to um, have fewer barriers in the way of getting things done. So looking at people returning to work, what do you think are the ethical considerations there? And then also how is technology playing a role in ensuring the safetyness? This is such a difficult um, issue because we have this, um, you know, once in a hundred years pandemic going on and people are trying to balance, you know, some things that we regard as very fundamental rights that people have, you know, the, the right to privacy, the right to be alive and to be functional and the right to move around. If you look at, you know, Americans or almost any culture, these are very fundamental rights. And you can't optimize for all three at the same time in this situation, because the safest thing to do for staying alive would be for everyone just to stay in their homes or apartments until the pandemic is over. We know that would be highly effective, but people do want to go back to work. So that means uh, an element of risk. And you can't safely go back to work without giving up some privacy. And, you know, particularly in America, this is a sensitive issue between employees and employers. We have a whole set of laws that were devised to keep employers from exploiting employees because of their health records and health status. But um, the, the federal government and, and states have made an exception for COVID because um, here we're balancing, let's say you're an employee you have a right to privacy, but uh, the employer has a right to keep other employees healthy. Mm -hmm. And an asymptomatic infected employee could infect a lot of other people. And for those in high risk groups, especially if they got infected by an asymptomatic coworker, it could be lethal. Mm -hmm. So um, there is no right answer. And the position that we took was, first of all, we needed to jump in and help because um, uh, computing and software and math are really critical to trying to get the best solution, the best balance for particular uh, employers. And secondly, um, you know, this has to be defined uh, at a local level. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, if you're in an area where the transmission rate is very high already, it's probably more likely you're going to get infected when you're out at home than when you're in the workplace. And for employers to know what a quote, safe rate of infection is in the workplace, mm -hmm. um, you need to really understand what the dynamics are outside. Mm -hmm. So we have an engine which protects people's data, but does give employers um, a look at, you know, the aggregate information to make decisions. And it's all powered by um, a model which is built on standard um, infectious disease epidemiology about the risk. And the very hardest part of this is testing asymptomatic people. Should you do it? And if so, how often? All of our models say you should do it. And the question of how often is something we're going to have to learn, but, but we're at least starting from the perspective that how often depends on a whole bunch of factors that we can take into account, including the type of work, how close people are together, what's happening 
in the local community with infection rates, et cetera. So we're balancing all these, all these things and um, working with employers. Mm -hmm. Among the most interesting are universities. And you can sort of say a university is sort of like an office building, a biotech company, um, a jail and a bar all at the same time because you have all these people that are congregated together in different environments. Often, you know, with tens of thousands of employees and their families, some state university systems, it'll be over 200,000 people that have to be dealt with. So I've sort of rattled through a whole bunch of things. The bottom line is there is no single right answer. We need to balance ethics and data and come up with the safest possible um, strategy for people to be able to go back to work when they can mm -hmm. um, and, and have themselves protected against each other really uh, in the workplace. It sounds like you guys are, are really thinking through all the challenges there. So I'd like to ask one final question and uh, we can keep it you know, 30 seconds or less, what your biggest hope for the future is, maybe on the other side of this pandemic. I think we could um, learn from the pandemic. In, in a way, the pandemic has magnified all the problems we knew existed before with disparities and uh, difficulty with transmitting healthcare to the broader population um, and the use of data in a public health infrastructure. So my big hope is that, um, as I say, when the dust settles, when we're climbing out of this, we'll take the reinvestment money and create a system that's more like the one that we would all wish to have, in which there's good information, good data, um, and a lot of human interaction built or uh, supported by a digital infrastructure that's not there to take the place of the human interaction, but actually to improve uh, the way we interact as people. A great way to end it. Thank you, Robert. Appreciate you taking this time to chat with us today. Thanks, great talking with you. Take care. Thanks for watching this interview. We're doing our best to keep our health community up to date and informed as the pandemic progresses. So please check back for more interviews and blog pieces with leading health experts, as well as check out our health COVID resource page for more information. Thanks again.